Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Community Matters. As you know, Think Tech has spent the last six weeks or more interviewing candidates for all of the various offices in Hawaii. Um, gubernatorial, uh, lieutenant governor, senators, representatives, and OHA from all the parties, the Democrats, the Greens, the Independents, and today we have someone from the Republican Party. And he is just the most delightful person I have met. And everybody knows I only talk to my best friends. So here is my new best friend, Lynn Barry Mariano. Welcome, sir. Aloha, Marshall. Thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to come on Think Tech today. Well, we want to do across the board. We want everybody to see as many candidates as we could present. Mm -hmm. uh, as I told you, we only did the candidates that, that uh, had challengers. We didn't do any of those people that were running unopposed. There was really no reason to do that. So you have a challenger. We had interviewed her, so now we want to talk to you. Now, let me, uh, Lynn? Yes. Is that, Lynn is a retired U.S. Army major with combat experience. Mm -hmm. And he's spent several fast-paced special operation forces, foreign relations, customs, protocol, domestic, international, politics, economic, and finance. Wow. <laughs> Following retirement, he successfully owned and operated a small financial planning business. Wonderful. Let's follow the money. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. So, um, now tell me, what are you doing? Oh, you worked at the Pentagon. Yes, ma'am. Pentagon Force Protection Agency to upgrade and integrate 21st technology physical security at the Pentagon. Wow. Yes, ma'am. I, I was given that opportunity to, and I was uh, hand-picked, to um, upgrade the Pentagon infrastructure interior and exterior for physical security. That required access control points for vehicles mm -hmm. and also pedestrian access uh, control points to include the new, uh, well, really not new, but uh, biometrics. So that was yeah. after 9-11 when yep. they rebuilt the Pentagon. That's correct, yes. Yeah. Well, that's quite a job. That's quite, a, my goodness, just finding your way around that building is, is a job. How long were you at the Pentagon? Uh, approximately 10 years. And um, again, I uh, was given that opportunity to upgrade that uh, right after 9-11. Mm -hmm. So prior to 9-11, you know, I was working as a consultant uh, in Virginia. And then a friend of mine called me, uh, used to be my former boss, and asked me, you know, would I come to Washington, D.C. and look at one of the programs that they had as part of the counterterrorist program? So I had that opportunity. After 9-11, I was one of uh, several individuals that went into Washington, D.C. to help with the interagency um, response. Following that, I went around the country designing, conducting, and training first responders, particularly um, law enforcement SWAT teams, on counter-terrorist uh, responses after 9-11. My goodness. And so then the Pentagon, uh, I was at a golf tournament, and the director of the Pentagon uh, knew who I was and asked if I would consider coming on to work for the Pentagon Force Protection Agency and to help him bring the Pentagon to the 21st century, 21st century technology while keeping the Pentagon open simultaneously 24 hours, 365 days a year. And so we did that. I was allowed to pick the right teams, coordinate with uh, various agencies, uh, departments, uh, the various uh, armed services, 
and uh, worked that out so that we could uh, upgrade the Pentagon while keeping it operational and open. That's an incredible building, my goodness, and all the things that they do there, mm -hmm. and they're all top secret? No, no, uh, not all top secret. There is some top secret, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of open. Yeah, so now you were born here. Yes, ma'am. I was uh, born um, in Kali. I grew up in uh, Kali Palama. Initially, I went to Puhali Elementary School, and then my family moved to other parts of uh, Kalihi, and we ended up at Kalihi Palama. So I went to Liki Liki, Kalakawa, I went to Farrington High School. The governors. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> class of 74. And then I had the uh, opportunity to go to Shamanad University, where I majored in um, psychology with a minor in business. And in, in fact, uh, after returning back home, I'm an adjunct professor at Shamanad, uh, you know, teaching. Now? Now, but I'm not teaching currently. Uh, in the law enforcement, criminal justice uh, positions, and I thought uh, leadership and management of police organizations. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a mouthful. So, um, when did you get into politics? In in all of that, and yes. you had time to to spend it in politics. When? Well, I, I initially started to have my taste for public service, you know, back in high school and really more in college. And so at that time, there was the first neighborhood board under uh, Mayor Frank Fossey. Right. And so I ran and was able to get uh, elected to that position. And so I served on the uh, Kali Palama Neighborhood Board for uh, two years. Mm -hmm. While simultaneously doing that, I've had some, uh, some mentors along the way, some senior senators uh, from Hawaii and they saw some of the potential that I had, and I was uh, selected and appointed by Governor Ariyoshi to be the West Sub Area Honolulu uh, Health Commissioner back in 1978. While taking a, a full load at Shamanad University, I was the student body treasurer uh, <laughs> at that time, and also on several committees like the uh, Kalihi Palama Finance Committee, uh, mental health uh, programs, what? and. So, what, did, what is a health commissioner? Well, at that time, you know, it was still kind of a, uh, well, to me, it was kind of new to me. So I was kind of learning my way around the bureaucracy and to help out to see what kind of things that we could do to help uh, Hawaii in, in a state of, of public health. So my job, again, was not a uh, high-level position, but it was just a, a commissioner in there to help you know, facilitate the process. Was that in the 70s when we got the, 1974 was when? It was around 76, 77. Yeah, but that was when the legislature passed the health care bill. Correct, and yeah. HMSA was uh, one of the insurance. Uh, yes, at that time. so that's, so and you were a commissioner when all of that was developing. Correct, yes. Oh, that's quite interesting. So, you have a job now? Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I, uh, yes, ma I'm, I'm doing a consulting over at the Pacific Command, uh, working in the J3. Uh, Pacific Command, of, that's the Army. Yeah, uh, no, it's a, it's a joint command. Joint command. Yes, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's now changed to U.S. Indo PACOM. And I do uh, consult. That means it's bigger. Yes. Indo. Indo PACOM. That's yes. much bigger. Yes. And so the area of operation is one of the largest uh, uh, combatant commands, uh, you know, in the uh, Department of Defense. And so I do a continuity of operations, consulting and continuity of operations and continuity of government. We, so. my goodness! And so you're going to run for the Senate? Yes, ma'am. I, I went what, ahead. What and, is? Um, I, I've all of this military, that all the experiences you have, mm -hmm. you are going to run for the Senate. How does all that translate into the way you see what you want to do should you uh, win as a senator from District 12? Oh, stop. Where's District 12? Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Senate District 12 is Kaka'ako, Ala Moana, Waikiki, Makali, Mo'ili'ili, and Lower Makiki. Lower Makiki. Yes. What? From the from the freeway. 
down oh. to Ma Makai. Okay. So now that's a huge district and so diverse. Yes. All the interests are so different. Mm -hmm. It seems strange that that would all be lumped together. Well, that's one of the nice things. Senate District 12, when you look at it and the face value, it's it's really the face of Hawaii. Yes. You know, you have Ala Moana, Kakako, mm -hmm. and Waikiki. And so with that diverse group, I bring a, with me a bunch of experience where I can work across aisle to make uh, no-win situations to win-win solutions. And I've done that time and time and again. Uh, I've managed budgets anywhere from a million up to $250 million and balance the budget every year to ensure that uh, we had the programs going. The program that I instituted, well, not me personally, but the director of the Pentagon Force Protection Agency, they instituted was the Pentagon uh, Century Program. It was a five-year program, $250 million, and we built pretty much 26 uh, pro uh, projects construction project from inception, concept, to design and development, to ending the construction, to implementation, where we turned it over to the end users. So the police officer currently, when you visit the Pentagon, they're, they're using the um, pedestrian access control points with the biometrics that go in through the, the various turnstiles. And when you come in with a vehicle, there's a, a, a way to check the vehicles to ensure that it's uh, authorized to be there at the, at the Pentagon. So I bring that type of knowledge where I can integrate plans, policies, programs, and fiscal responsibility you know, into this district because again, sitting back on the outside, looking in since returning back home, you know, the, I see the same old status quo. It's a one-party system. And with that one-party system, there's really no healthy debate in which to move things forward. So I bring fresh ideas, uh, new innovative ways, and have the ability to work across aisle, you know, to help work to, one, make Hawaii affordable again, but at the same time, to uh, be p even prouder of Hawaii. Because that's why I traveled around the world, and also, uh, well, at, over at the Pentagon, you know, play Hawaiian music, you know, to promote the Aloha Oh, that's spirit. right, you do play, yes. Yes, ma'am, yeah. Yeah, I remember that, yes. Yeah. And so the, you decided you wanted to run for the Senate. Yes. And you had these, do, can you tell us in more specific ideas or just to the district as a whole? Okay, or that well, I, uh, that's the, thank you for, for that opportunity. You know, for example, uh, when you look on the outside, the present administration uh, has a plan, you know, with the city right. to fix the homeless problem. But it's only a short-term solution. There's no realistic long-term fix, you know, to solve the homeless problems. All we're doing is moving human beings from one location to another location, only for them to be in a revolving door to come back to the same location. I would uh, bring the fresh they, idea. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. I want to hear all of your ideas, yes. and we need to take a break, Yes, and we'll be back in 60 seconds. So I want, I want to hear your whole program. I don't want to interrupt your program. So let's take a break, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. I'm Jay Fidel, Think Tech. Think Tech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha.
Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are Community Matters, and we're back today with my new best friend, Lynn Berry Mariona. And he is running for the Senate, State Senate from District 12. And you, that is the most diverse district in all of the state of Hawaii, mm -hmm. I'm sure. You were just beginning to tell us about your plan for the homeless. And it seems to me that the city nor the state has a plan. They just keep moving people around. In fact, they don't even treat them like people. They herd them like cattle. Yeah, it's a t statistics. Yes. It's a numbers game. It's a numbers, yeah. I heard the governor the other night say they reduced by so many percentage. That's that people. Yes. Okay, so tell us your plan. And just, if I could, Certainly. for every person, it affects four or more individuals. You know, so that person may, ha you know, have parents. Right. And if they're, you know, and then those parents, you know, have spread. And if they're married, you know, now you have more. So by taking individuals as a number or statistics, that's not solving the issue. I would suggest that, um, and this is some of the things that I would have as far as passion, and that is to treat the homeless in a long-term solution. I would sp split the homeless into two categories. Category A, which is individuals that need help and assistance, and category B, those that need treatment, either mental health or drug addiction. And so when we do uh, attack, say, category B, for uh, those that need treatment, we need to not just provide treatment for them. We need to also provide training and even what you call aftercare so that they can bring themselves and mold themselves back into society. And so we need to provide that. Just recently, this past legislation, the, um, the governor signed $140 million to upgrade the mental health facility on the Windward side. It's upgrading the security and also 144 beds. Should I be fortunate enough to get elected, I would go back and relook at that and just say, well, security has been great for all those years, and maybe we need to upgrade the security just a tad, but increase the bed capacity from 144 to maybe up to 500 or oh. whatever that can do, because then we can take the homeless that's on the streets that have mental illness and provide them the treatment that they need. And that's, that's not what we're doing. No, and, and the Supreme Court did make a ruling with the ADA. Yes. That certain people that have certain illnesses mm -hmm. don't need to be institutionalized. They need homes. Correct. Special homes to meet those needs that schizophrenia and some of the others they don't need institution. They need a home, home care. That's correct. And, and I, I agree. But that's, again, those are the common sense things that we need to take a look at rather than just doing a, a, a statistic number. And then going back to category A, those that need help. I've gone out and I've talked to several of the homeless people that's on the street while I'm waving signs or walking through the neighborhood, going door to door and meeting residents. I will come across one or two homeless individuals, then I'll sit down and, and chat with them. Some of them, you know, they have a lot of pride. That of they, they don't want to hand out. What they want to do is they want to earn, you know, some of the living, uh, and, and they're working paycheck to paycheck just to make ends meet. So we need to look at this as a long-term solution. So category A are individuals and families that we need to help, and we need to provide them that type of assistance recently for affordable housing. All of this are all interconnected, yes. uh, Marsha, and that is, you know, affordable housing. You know, recently they said they were going to set aside some money for affordable housing, but the governor approved only 10 years for affordable housing. So if you move someone into a condominium, for example, and you only give them a 10-year life cycle, and after that, then the developer, you know, can be able to resell that, well, that's not really a life cycle for a family, particularly a young family. So 10 years later, they may not be able to make ends meet to even buy that condo, or then they may have to move out. Well, 10 years from now, if the same status quo is going, 
the housing is going to be unattainable for those individuals that we put in there. And now we've increased the homeless population. Well, even today, when everything on the water, all the way around the island, yes. is a million five, regardless of the condition it's in. But that's affordable according to the status yes. quo. Affordable for who? Yes. A million five? Yes. We have and family. That's all around the island. It doesn't matter what part of the island. Yeah, it, yeah, it's statewide. And statewide. When, when you look at that, we have uh, family members that's leaving the islands to go to the mainland because it's, uh, it's more affordable for them to, to live. So it brings my next point, and that is education. You know, I would go in and I would propose a new thing as for what I call investing in Hawaii, investing in the youth. So if you're a college graduate from Hawaii, whether you went to University of Hawaii, Chaminade, or any other local schools, or in the mainland, USC, Princeton, Yale, if you come after graduation, come back to Hawaii, and you work for the state, or you work for the city government, or any organization that invests in Hawaii, every year that you work and invest back in Hawaii, we should deduct your, uh, your student loan. And while wow. you're and then while you're working for the state or the uh, city, and if you and if they find some cost efficiencies, and just say I'll just throw this number out a million dollars in savings, well a percentage of that should go towards that individual that found that savings, and maybe put it in as a savings account for them to later on maybe purchase a house, or you know increase their pay. But those are the things that we could do. And just think if we start now. Five years from now, you know, we have a, a, thru, a slew of new entrepreneurs, new business people, students coming in, and we can look and find efficiencies that we have in this high cost we have in Hawaii, and maybe bring some of the price down. Well, what about people that don't go to college, that are all these other skills that don't require a degree? Well, what about those skills? Why, why, why are we just looking at a degree? What about those people, because we have so many unskilled, yes. and I don't. I know lots of people with a degree that don't make as much money as a plumber. Right, uh, but then <laughs> you know, sending them, you know, some to to trade schools and all that. The reason I just gave that example of no, the I, college I students you, because of the student loan that they get when they graduate yeah. to come in. But I understand for, where you're going, but it's like we never address people yes. that are talented with their hands that are, that do all of these uh, other things mm -hmm. that require, that our daily living requires. And, and your point's well taken, and I totally agree with that. And that we need to provide them some type of trade that they, uh, that they don't have so that they can learn so that can, they can get higher paying jobs. Yeah, because you know, we tend to say, oh, you can't, the no. child says, I can't do math, but they go as a carpenter, and all of a sudden, they, they are dealing with math. That, yes. That's, that's correct. Yeah. So they got rid of the word, I can't do, and then they're doing and get paid very well. Yes. That's the same thing. Now, the other portion is doctors. Right. You know, we have doctors that's, uh, that's been working pretty hard. You know, a lot of them are in the age where they're starting to retire. So we need to start to attract new doctors. Uh, into the area, but we're, we're having a challenge doing that. So I would uh, look at maybe doing some and, and pushing for uh, some type of incentives to keep doctors here. Uh, also, maybe some tax cuts so that we can keep doctors and attract doctors from outside to come in. Hawaii should not be one of the lowest uh, levels as far as medical care. You know, we're, we're an island state and we should be be able to have the best and the brightest. So we have, for example, if you uh, have an illness and you need special treatment on Maui, you have to fly to Honolulu to get right. treated, okay? So family support, if they want to come, is out of their own pocket to come and stay with the patient. Say they, they're well, they have two weeks of rehabilitation, now they go back to Maui. So for follow-up care, the patient will either have to come fly back to get that treatment, or the doctor and staff will have to fly to Maui to get that. Well, we should have uh, virtual-type medicine 
where the doctors here in Oahu can use the FaceTime well, okay. to treat patients. And now, yes. the issue with that, yes. the professional law, that's absolutely perfect. It should be. Mm -hmm. we, we need rural health, all islands, all islands. However, the fiber optic cable that delivers this mm -hmm. is the problem. Yes. That's the problem. Well, and that's where we talk about investing back into Hawaii. So if this is the type of that things that we need issue. to do, we need to go ahead and, and fix that. Yeah. You know, starting at Senate District 12, you know, we have some of those infrastructures already in place that needs to be upgraded. And then we need to broaden that. So as a state senator, you know, looking across the statewide, those are some of the things that we need to address. And I'm, I'm ready to work across the aisle and with my uh, colleagues to ensure that we can find a long-term solution to the temporary fixes that we're doing right now. Because even the health department admits that that is a big issue, yeah. that they can't deliver services because yeah. of the fiber optic cables. Yeah. They can't, uh, telemedicine is wonderful if the fiber optic cable can yeah. deliver. Yeah, but if you if you have the same status quo, you'll keep having, we can't do, we, we can't, can't do. do. Yeah. And over when I worked at the Pentagon or other jobs that I had in the past, you know, no was not the answer. It was, how can I make things better? Yeah, and, and that is, I'm, I'm loving this, because I can see that exactly what you're saying about health care. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, anybody that really tackles health care on the neighbor islands, even rural Honolulu, yes. would be crowned a king or something. Because those issues are daily issues. Like you said, you have to fly to Honolulu mm -hmm. to get certain issues. Um, if we could look at those islands and really, seriously, mm -hmm. and as a senator, you get to work with the senators from those islands. They will tell you, every, the reason I know this is because we've had them on the show, and that's been their complaint. Yes. That's their big complaint about, uh, and they all said, oh, you people from Honolulu do not understand. Yes, and see, that's where I do understand because, um, with the past experience I had traveling worldwide and also in the continental United States, those are some of the things that we can bring here if we think outside of the box. Right. You know, and we need to work, you know, collectively as a team, you know, and bridge that gap. Rather than saying, no, we can't, we should say, yes. Yes, we can. <laughs> we, yes, we can, but, and then some. Uh -huh. You know, what's the best thing? Because if Hawaii can be the number one medical industry, we not just only help fix and, and uh, the, the citizens of, of the state of Hawaii, but we also have those international from the Pacific Rim, you know, that may be coming here for treatment. Well, they do. To Tripler, as you yes. know, that's the only hospital in the Pacific. That's correct. Well, Queens is a really great No, hospital. I meant that, yes. that all of the trust territory people yes. come to, all the military from yes. Guam and mm -hmm. all these other places, they all come to Tripler. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we should have more. We should have more. Yes, and we should have good medical facilities on the other islands as well. Right. Yes. So. And we have a really good school here, the John Burns, Burns. Medical School you know, and also Chaminade and also uh, BYU, uh, where they have good quality teaching. And so we can use those students as part of their training to help expand the medical care that we have here. To include, I think uh, Josh Green has a motto, his 4-H program, yeah. and that is taking students to help with the homeless uh, population as part of that pilot program. I'm not too well versed into that program. I know just from the outside looking in, but as uh, if I'm fortunate to be elected, I can dive into those things and, and bring some common sense to some of the organized chaos that we cur currently have. Well, I want you to take a look at this camera and tell us 
why we should vote for you. Right? Well, again, Marsha, thank you for the opportunity. I began public service in Hawaii while still uh, serving, uh, going to college and serving on the neighborhood board. You know, I had, uh, I traveled the world uh, all over, and, and each time that I traveled, I brought the aloha spirit uh, to those uh, countries and also to those states. I have lots of friends that's all over. One of the things that I have done is I have looked at federal, state, and local jurisdictions across when I went around, as I said earlier, uh, doing exercises for uh, first responders and learning that how we can bridge the gap from shortfalls and gaps and making it things from a concept to a reality. And while at the same time being conservative and saving money. Um, as a state senator, I bring fresh ideas. Um, I bring expertise, I bring leadership. Uh, conservative values where you know, we need to balance the budget and also cut wasteful spending. And so with those things, selecting me as, uh, as your state senator would not only help Hawaii to improve on some of the gaps and shortfalls that we have here, but to take us to the next level. You know, Hawaii should not be a place where we have more outside investors. We should have locals investing in Hawaii as part of my education program that I would like to promote, and that is investing back in Hawaii. Well, thank you so much, and good luck with your election. And after the election, you will come back and visit us again. Well, thank you so much, Marsha, for the opportunity, and also uh, Think Tech for this opportunity to give me a chance to talk to you, the uh, citizens of Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. We'll see you next time. Yes.